Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. Starting in verse 13, if you'll remember the context has been these ongoing uh, episodes with Christ where the, the religious leaders are in controversy. And here we come to verse 13, which reads, And they, that's the Sanhedrin, sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius. Let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. <coughs> in 156 AD, just outside the Roman stadium in Smyrna, that is present day Izmir, Turkey, the aged 86 year old Polycarp was violently thrown from a chariot. He had been arrested for his faith, and he was about to stand on trial in the Roman stadium. The choice before him was clear deny the faith or die. Polycarp was probably the oldest living Christian at this point in church history. He had grown up in a Christian home with Christian parents, and he had personally known the Apostle John. Standing to his feet with a dislocated leg, the martyrdom of Polycarp recounts his final moments. I'd like to read for you an excerpt. Please, please listen as I read this to you. As if suffering nothing, remember he has a dislocated leg, as if suffering nothing, Polycarp went eagerly forward with all haste and was conducted to the stadium where the tumult was so great that there was no possibility of being hurt. Now as Polycarp was entering into the stadium, there came to him a voice from heaven saying, Be strong and show yourself a man, O Polycarp. No one saw who it was that spoke to him, but those of our brethren who were present heard the voice. And as he was brought forward, the tumult became great. And when he came near, the proconsul, that's kind of like the leader, the Roman leader in that region, asked him whether he was Polycarp. On his confessing that he was, the proconsul sought to persuade him to deny Christ, saying, Swear, and I will give you liberty. Reproach Christ. Polycarp declared, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And then the proconsul yet again pressed him and said, Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Remember, Caesar claimed to be the Lord. He answered, since you are vainly urgent that, as you say, I should swear by the fortune of Caesar and pretend not to know who and what I am, hear me declare with boldness, I am a Christian. And if you wish to learn what the doctrines of Christianity are, appoint me a day and you shall hear them. The proconsul replied, persuade the people. But Polycarp said, to you, I have thought it right to offer an account of my faith. For we were taught to give all due honor, which entails no injury upon ourselves, to the powers and authorities which are ordained of God. But as for these, I do not deem them worthy of receiving any account from me. The proconsul then said to him, I have wild beasts, I have wild beasts standing at hand. To these I will cast you unless you repent. But he answered, Call them then, 
For we are not accustomed to repent of what is good in order to adopt that which is evil. And it is well for me to be changed from what is evil to what is righteous. But again, the proconsul said to him, I will cause you to be consumed by fire, seeing you despise the wild beasts, if you will not recant. But Polycarp said, You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour, and after a little is extinguished, but are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why do you tarry? Bring forth what you will. And then was carried into effect the fires with greater speed than it had been spoken. And thus Polycarp gave back to God what already belonged to God himself. Polycarp belonged to Jesus. You could say that was his identity. Ye Jesus Nigerning. A possession of Christ. Jesus was his king, and in obedience to his king, Polycarp paid the ultimate price. He died for Jesus. And in our text today, Christ is making great demands to give to God what belongs to God. This is a call not so much to die for, but to live for God. There's no part of your life that you're allowed to keep to yourself. It's a call to give God entirety of your life. Most of us, I imagine, will not be called upon in our lives to die for Jesus, like Polycarp. But here in our text is a call to live for Him, to be a Living sacrifice, as Josh led us in singing this morning, to be his possession. Here's what we're going to see in this text. Because God will have all of you or none of you, you need to give your life in its entirety to Jesus. You can't treat God like a bumper sticker, some sort of addition to your life. He's not an accessory to make your spiritual wardrobe a bit better. He's not a category to add so as to get a better life. Heaven in the end. He's not spiritual insurance. Don't twist it. He stands over everything and he says, Mine. Because God will have all of your life or none of your life, Give all of your heart to Jesus. In our continued study of Mark, we've been considering the final weeks of Christ's life. The context has been Christ taking the religious establishment head on. And Christ's crosshairs, if you will, is the temple in Jerusalem, which has come to represent false and dead religion. The temple's been forsaken by Jesus. You could say the Shekinah glory of God incarnate has departed, and Jesus is now establishing a new temple, a house of prayer amongst those who have faith. Last week we saw that delegates from the Sanhedrin challenged Christ's authority, and in response to this delegation, Jesus told a parable in which God is going to tear away a vineyard from the tenant farmers of Israel, and he's going to give it to others. Then he declared that he himself is the chief cornerstone that's being rejected by these religious leaders. With this new cornerstone, God is building a new temple. Not with bricks, not with stones, but with the people consisting of both Jews and Gentiles. Each person believing in Jesus represents a spiritual stone in this new spiritual temple. And the cornerstone is the most important stone in God's construction project because it's the foundational stone which brings about levelness and straight lines to every other stone that will be laid. They're always going to be laid in reference to that cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone in the new spiritual temple. And so at the outset, what I want to draw your attention to is the context, the immediate context, which has the temple as the main topic, even though it's not directly being discussed in our text. Well, our text begins in verse 13, reading, They sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. 
The, day, the they doing the sending is the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin consisted of 71 members of the most powerful body in all the land. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. And what we're going to see in the next two Sundays is today we get the Pharisees. Next week we're going to get the Sadducees. The following week we're going to get the scribes. One after another, this Sanhedrin is sending delegates to take Jesus out. This is war. This is war. But remember... In our text, who these Herodians are that the Pharisees are united with. They were, you know, you could call them political sellouts. Political sellouts to the Roman Empire. The Pharisees, on the other hand, these were the spiritual ones who were supposedly waiting for the son of David to return to overthrow the imperialistic colonizing rule of Rome. A Rome that the Herodians supported. But as the ancient proverb goes... My, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy in this case is the living God come wrapped in human flesh. These two groups have been united since all the way back in chapter 3, verse 8, in a demonic, diabolical plot to destroy Jesus. Here in verse 13, they are casting their net, if you will, over the Lamb of God so as to trap him. Verse 14 continues. Please follow along with me. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Christ's enemies recognize a double truth. Jesus is honest, and he does not live for the applause of man. But listen, this is flattery, not encouragement. Not compliment. What is flattery? A lot of people think I'm not going to encourage somebody because I don't want to flatter them. Let's, let's understand flattery. Josh once compared it, Josh Pinnell, our dean, once compared it to gossip, and I find this very helpful. Gossip is saying to another what you would never say to an individual's face. I love you. <laughs> Flattery, on the other hand, is saying to an individual's face what you would never say about them behind their backs. Well, these men are out to destroy Jesus, not to encourage him. And just as Jesus asked them a question about John the Baptist in the previous story, where an either answer would get them in trouble with the people, they now have done the same thing. They're now putting forward a question to Jesus where an either answer is going to get Jesus killed. The question they ask has to do with paying taxes to their Roman colonizers. The legal requirement was the annual imperial poll tax of one denarius. That was equal to one day's wages for the average occupation. Now, if you want to do a little study on the hearts of man, you could ask, has anybody throughout history ever loved paying taxes? Well, you can see in your text the answer is 2,000 years ago, they didn't like paying taxes either. This was a tax that was instituted 2,000 years ago back in A.D. 6, and it ignited a Jewish rebellion which declared it cowardly, unlawful for a Jew to pay taxes to Caesar. The rebellion was violently put down, but those who identified with its ideology they were strongly present even in Christ's day. Indeed, many historians say this is what led to the demise of Jerusalem and the destroying of the temple, ultimately. The means God used, if you will. In fact, one of Jesus' own disciples, Mark chapter 3, 18, informs us was a zealot. Simon, the zealot, he belonged to this, part, this political group. Well, here's the dilemma in the question. Here's the dilemma in the question being posed to Jesus. If Jesus says, yes, you should pay the tax, he's going to look like a blasphemer. He's going to be discredited in the eyes of the people. He'll, he'll look like a Roman sellout who is not loyal to Israel. He will immediately make himself the enemy of Israel. But if he answers, no, don't pay your taxes, well, remember who's there, the Herodians who support Rome, they're going to report it back. He'll be guilty of sedition, treason. And treason in the eyes of the Roman government 
was a capital offense, likely to get you crucified on a cross. This is a lose-lose question. But Jesus and his authority is not about to lose this fight, and he answers yet again in typical Jesus pattern with his own question. I love this. I just love that Jesus answers questions with questions. Look with me at verses 15 through 16. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Well, a denarius was a silver Roman coin bearing the image of Tiberius Caesar. And its inscription, which Jesus is talking about here, its inscription read as follows. Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine, that means God, son of the God, Augustus. Jesus asked them to bring him one. Oh my goodness, this, this, is, this is irony indeed. On, first, on the one hand, Jesus is too poor. He doesn't, he, 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 he doesn't have a place to lay his head, and he had no coins clinking around in his pocket. But what is more... While, there are, while these men are trying to trap him as a blasphemer and a seditious rebel, they, in fact, have coins bearing idols and idolatrous declarations in their pockets at the temple. They're breaking the second commandment, which was very serious, at least they said it was, very serious, which reads, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Listen, these are the same people who went in, into uh, uh, Pilate's uh, court and they said, you need to remove these gold shields, which had no image, because it simply said, Caesar, hail Caesar, from your friend Pilate. These people threw riots over this stuff. And yet, hypocritically, they've got idols in their pocket. They are hypocritical idolaters indeed. And Jesus has just exposed them. He's exposed them in front of everyone. They're already paying taxes to Caesar. Caesar's got you in his pocket. You think you've got him in his pocket? He's in, you're in his pocket. Say, the fight is over. This was a first round knockout. On May 25th, 1965, boxers Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston had a famous rematch in which Ali knocked Liston out in the very first round. This is unprecedented. And one of the most famous pictures in all of sports history, Muhammad Ali may be seen flexing over Liston's limp body and he's taunting him. Get up and fight, sucker! That's exactly what's happening in our text. Jesus has delivered a knockout blow to his tag team, this tag team. And now he'll taunt them with one of the most memorable statements in literary history. Everybody, Shakespeare, everybody knows this statement. Look with me at the end of at verse 17. The scene ends with Christ declaring, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Or as the NIV puts it, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. It's a very simple truth here. Obey the law of the land, except when the law of the land comes into, conclu into collusion with the law of God. It's an obligation it is the obligation of everyone, everyone in this room, to submit to the law of the land, and doing so is not a violation of God's law. What is more, both Paul and Romans and Romans 13 and Peter and 1 Peter 2 both teach that we are to submit to the governing authorities. In other words, human government is legitimate in the eyes of God. Jesus is not an anarchist, and his goal is not a theocracy. What's a theocracy? It's a government that's run by the church. Jesus is here teaching that God is sovereign over all things, everything, including politics, including bad politicians. 
There are certain laws and duties that governments may expect from their people which do not de deny the responsibilities given to us by God. Commentator Mark Strauss succinctly puts it like this. Jesus is pointing out that there are realms of authority for both Caesar and God. And allegiance to one does not necessarily mean disloyalty to the other. Polycarp was ready, even from his own word, to submit to the government. Except when the government commanded him to disobey God. And so we may say it is the responsibility of everybody in this room to submit to the governing officials of Ethiopia where they are not themselves violating or calling upon you to violate God's law. What is more, we can even say it's quite possible to be a faithful Christian who is deeply committed to one's country, he's a patriot, and even engaged in politics. Did you know that in ancient Rome, Rome, there were Roman soldiers and those who were faithful Christians, even in Caesar's own household, deeply engaged in the political affairs of Rome. Some of you in this room might be called to engage in politics, world politics, local politics, national politics, international politics. And if you are called to the world of politics, I want you to hear this starting right here from this pulpit. We here at Trinity Fellowship, we stand with you. We've got your back. We stand with you, and we encourage you, brother, sister, run into that office, run into that sector, and wave the banner of Christ in every sector of society. Go honor Jesus, politicians. Go honor Jesus, government workers. But listen. The lion's share of the emphasis in Christ's great answer to the Pharisees and the Herodians is not in our responsibility to Caesar. It's our responsibility to God. Give to God. Give to God what is God's. Give to God what is God's. Remember, the context of this controversy is the temple. Not in our direct text, but they're standing right there. They're in the temple. This is all about the temple. This was to be God's house. And in the context of our study, God has returned home, if you will. And as chapter 11, verse 18 tells us, they were trying to destroy him. God's come home, and they're trying to kill the owner. Listen, this is the ancient sin. God created Eden and Adam and Eve and he united, and these two, they united with sa Satan in a plan to replace God. They didn't want to be like God, did they? They were already like God. You'll be like God. I am like God. And they wanted to replace God. They wanted that garden without God. And then after judgment, God promised the Israelites that he would give them a land a land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. This was to be the second Eden. The first Adam and Eve, they, they, you know, they broke covenant, tried to steal the garden. I'm going to try to do it again, but I'm going to do it with a redeemed people, Israelites, who I've set free. Now, because of free grace, I set them free from the Egyptians. They didn't free themselves. Now they'll be thankful. They'll be faithful in my house. And in my home. But they too rebelled against God, breaking covenant. So in judgment, he destroyed the temple. He annihilated Israel. And he scattered Jerusalem, the Judah, the tribe of Judah, across the nations. And after a time in mercy, after 70 years in mercy, he brought them back and he allowed the temple to be rebuilt yet again. But now... In our text, Yahweh is on the scene yet again, ready to claim what is his. And in our text, both the government and the religious establishment are united in a sinful front to take out God. And God will either have all of them or none of them. But this text was not written for them. By the time this text was written and published, it'll be too late for them. 
Indeed, in this text, Christ is not looking to bring reform. He's not trying to teach a lesson. The curse has been spoken. This isn't reform. This is judgment. This text wasn't written for them. It was written for you and me. Because God stands over all things and he says, this is mine. He is the creator and everything else is the created. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those, that's you and me, who dwell therein. Look at your life. God stands over your life. God stands over everything about you. And he says, it's mine. Your body, it's mine. Your clothes are mine. Your house, it's mine. Your family, it's mine. Your friends, they're mine. Your boyfriend, he's mine. Your girlfriend, she's mine. Your spouse is mine. Your children are mine. Your country is mine. Your car is mine. That money in your bank account, it's mine. That money in your pocket, it's mine. Your job is mine. Your thoughts are mine. Your heart is mine. You are mine. I'm the creator. You're dust. God says, give to God what is God's. But by nature, due to the fall, each of us, we recoil to that. A simple survey of our lives would demonstrate that you and I, apart from grace, we wholeheartedly disagree with Jesus. Your life demonstrates that you actually think you belong to yourself. By nature, do you live a sacrificial life? By nature, do you give financially to God? Do you give sacrificially to God? Do you pray daily? No, you probably play video games and you look at porn. Do you listen to God from His Word daily? Daily. Are you obsessed with His glory? His fame? Does it consume you? Have you ever fallen asleep consumed with the glory of God? Not consumed about your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your financial situation, your bad boss. The glory of God. Have you ever once had a sleepless night? Because you can't stop. You're obsessed with the glory of God. That's what you were made to be. Do you join God's people in weekly prayer to bring about His glory? You can't even get up on time. Unless it's for your own purposes. Christ isn't merely commanding these Pharisees and Herodians to give to God what is God's. He's saying to you and to me the same thing. And the entirety of the Bible teaches that God won't accept anything short of 100% of you. 99? Let me just hold back this one thing, Jesus. I'm going to hold back this one thing. It's one category of my life. I, I know, but look, I've given you 99%. You've got my finances. You've got most of my time, but this one category. I'm just going to love this sin. I'm actually going to just pet this sin. I'm going to keep this sin. This sin is precious to me. You can have 99%, Jesus, but you can't have that. Well, listen. The entirety of the Bible is teaching that God won't accept anything short of 100% because God will have all of you or none of you. You give your life to Jesus. This is a life and death situation. Because God will have all of your life or none of your life, you have to give all of your heart to Jesus. Do you see that? Give to God what is God's? It's everything. Our text ends by telling us the Pharisees and Sadducees, they marveled. They're shocked. Astonished. What are they shocked at? What are they marveling at? They're marveling at the wisdom of Jesus Christ. But listen, I want you to listen really carefully to me. Christ's wisdom did not change them. They didn't give to God what is God's. 
a reminder that we can enter into religious life and we can go very, very far without actually being changed. You could be a member in the church, upstanding. You haven't done, you haven't given to God what God says is His. You can go very, very far. You can marvel. Perhaps you do marvel at a great sermon. Oh, he's so gifted. I felt something. I was in tears. But you haven't been truly changed. Have you been changed? These Pharisees and these Herodians, they didn't change because they had a two-fold problem. Firstly, they don't want to give to God what is God's, but they have a more fundamental, a deeper problem than that. Secondly, they can't want to give to God what is God's. They can't. They can't want to want to. It is impossible for them to want to give to God what is God's because they are rebels from the hearts. They have rebellious hearts. There is no decision to make because they are incapable of making a decision. Their wills are bound in a prison, locked. The key's been thrown away. They can't give to God what is God's. They're not rebels because they rebelled. They rebelled because at the most fundamental level, that is what they are. They're rebels by nature, and they cannot go against their nature. Can an Ethiopian change his color? Can a leopard his spots? Neither then can you, who are accustomed to evil, do good. It's our nature. Indeed, they have dead hearts, and this is what each one of us is by nature. Each of us is naturally under the power of Satan. Satan has you in his grips. Like Adam and Eve, we have united with Satan. I know that doesn't sound good to a religious person's ears. We have united with Satan in a sinful rebellion against God. Do you realize that this is what you are? This is your identity apart from God's saving grace in your life. This is what our children are. Those of us who are parents, this is what our children are apart from the miracle of regeneration. It is impossible to change. If you're not a Christian and you're here today, don't get it twisted. Christianity is not a list of rights and wrongs. Christianity is something that changes you at your core and makes you a new creation. In God's government, the penalty for rebellion and the penalty for for treason, the penalty for sedition is one and the same as most earth earthly governments. That is death. But it's not death by hanging, not death by a firing squad, not death by an electric chair. No, this is the penalty. The penalty for rebellion in God's economy is soul death. Death forever. Where one forever loses his soul in the re very real hell fires. But listen, let me take it a step further. Even if you could go with me, you heard about this, this uh, submarine that went and checked out the Titanic. But they all, it collapsed, it, it was destroyed. Let's say we could take a submarine to the depths of hell just for five minutes. Come, join me, get on my submarine, and we could go there together and we could hear the blood curdling screams. Even if you could see the flames. Maybe feel them. Just five minutes. Get out of the submarine. F feel it just for five minutes. I'll drop you off. I'll be right back. I'm going to go around the corner. I'm going to pick you up in five minutes. Five minutes of the flames of hell. If you could feel them. And even if you were taken and shown your future allotted shackles and your eternal prison cell, and then suddenly I said, I'm back. We're going back to earth. I brought you back to earth. And God gave you a second chance. That would not be enough to cause you to change. It couldn't change you. It wouldn't be enough to make you be possessed with this desire to get back to God's, what is God's. Because by nature, you're spiritually dead. You're already a spiritual prisoner in the shackles of your own making, which is your sin. You can no more free yourself than a dead man can resuscitate himself. <laughs> Now, there's 
something else taking place in our text. I want you to see the God-man. I want you to imagine it with your mind's eye. See the God-man, see Christ Jesus holding Rome's foreign currency, this silver denarius with Tiberius, his image on it. The image of the so-called divine son of Caesar Augustus. But the one who's holding that coin, listen, he himself is a form of foreign currency. He too is the image of his father, Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is heaven's currency sent down to buy people back from their chaos, to buy people back from their addictions, to buy people back from the sinfulness of their rebellion, their thievery of stealing God's glory. He came to buy people back. You see, sin has to be paid for. Sin has to be atoned for. And that is the point of hell. Hell is a place to pay off the debts of your sins. But you had fun in life. You were racking them up. I remember one time I was traveling and I was staying at a hotel. It was late at night and I went through the hotel and I just pulled everything out of the refrigerator. I started eating it and drinking it. And I went down the next day, not knowing that it was going to cost me. And the guy said, hey, did you eat anything or drink anything in the, uh, in the, in the little refrigerator in your room? I said, yeah, ev everything. <laughs> we, he just starts tacking it up. And then suddenly, something that should have cost me like 10 euro was like 150 euro. Oh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it for a moment. But I'll tell you, when I woke up the next day, it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth what I paid for it. The crimes against God, listen, you enjoy them in this life, but they're considered so weighty. You're, you're, you're stacking up a debt that's so high that can only be paid in an eternal hell. You don't have enough money to pay for this. You and I, we need a currency that is so costly that it can pay off that eternal debt. Only heaven's currency can pay such a debt because only God himself is of eternal weightiness that he can swallow up that debt. Jesus was sent as a man to pay precisely that exact transaction. Standing in front of these Pharisees and the Herodians is God's heavenly foreign currency, the divine image of God incarnate, and only He can pay for the sins that you and I deeply carry in our hearts. At the cross, the divine transaction took place wherein heaven's currency paid for your very real sins. The moment you trust in Jesus, it is as if you always gave to God what is God's? That's what God sees in you. And it is just as if Jesus never did. It is as if that debt that you've been racking up became his. That's not as if. That is exactly what happened. And it is just as if Jesus never, ever, ever obeyed God. Never gave to God what belonged to God. At the cross, Jesus, the only one who always gave to God what is God's, took on your rebellion and he died the rebel's death that is a cross and full pardon, 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 full pardon, free. It is offered to everyone who believes in Jesus from the heart. Your problem is fixed. But the second problem of the Pharisees and of the Herodians is the problem of everyone by nature. Do you remember that problem? Makes it hard to get this free grace. Makes it impossible to get this free grace. And that's the problem of a dead heart. 
A dead heart is not awake to spiritual realities. A dead heart cannot even desire the free grace of the cross in the person of Jesus Christ. Sure, I could try to use emotions and melt your hearts, and sure, you might come forward, or sure, you might say the sinner's prayer, but tomorrow you go right back to your life. Your dead life. But you see, the cross, the cross is the double cure. For at the cross, Jesus died for specific sinners. He died for those he elected and predestined from before the foundations of the earth. If you don't like that, I didn't make it up. It's Ephesians 1. And I stand behind it with all my heart. It is precious in my sight. Before the foundations of the earth, God predestined a people to save. And what God pays for, what God paid for at the cross... God gets. God gets what he paid for because Jesus' blood is effectual. That means that Jesus' blood, the transaction at the cross, it actually accomplishes something. The cross doesn't just make it possible for you to be saved. It saves you indeed, and it ensures that you will be saved. The Holy Spirit who has a united will with both the Father and the Son in time. He comes to those who were purchased at the cross and He applies the finished work of the cross through regeneration. In regeneration, you might say that the Holy Spirit is heaven's mailman. You might say the Holy Spirit is heaven's DHL delivery service. Delivering what heaven paid for. For a new heart. That's what Jesus bought for you at the cross, a new heart. This is what it means to be born again. Ezekiel 36, 26 explains regeneration or being born again in this way. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit takes out your dead heart of stone, which cannot believe in Jesus, nor does it ever desire to. And in its place, He gives you a heart of flesh, which is now capable of trusting in Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives you faith. It's granted to you. It's a gift from God. The Holy Spirit gives you faith because Jesus paid for faith at the cross. How do you get this new heart? How do you get this new heart? When does it happen? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 teaches us that this happens through the preaching of the word. It happens by what I'm doing right now. Oh, that somebody this very moment would be born again. Oh, that somebody right here who walked into this room, that threshold, who walked through that threshold, a dead man, a dead woman, would believe in Jesus right now. That you would be born again and come to saving faith in the person of Jesus Christ. That all of the promises of God that are yes and an amen in Christ Jesus would be yours because you cling to Jesus. Hallelujah. It's yours. For the taking. Don't say to yourself, well, I'm not predestined because I did that one sin. I slept with that one guy, that one girl. I stole that one thing. Oh, I'm so sinful, I could never be predestined. Oh, I grew up in a church, and look how bad I still am. I still have these problems. I could never be predestined. The Bible says, whoever believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. And so right now, as an ambassador of heaven, I command you to believe in the high king of heaven who is seated at the right hand of God. Believe in Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. If you're here and you're trusting in Jesus from the heart, this is the only explanation you have. Heaven's currency, the image of God, bought you with a price. Acts chapter 20, verse 18. Jesus 
purchased with his own blood. The church. 1 Corinthians 6.20 You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Because God will have all of you or God will have none of you. He bought you. So give him what is his. Give him your life. Give him your born again heart that now beats for him. Live for him as one who has been born again. You do now have the ability. You have the ability to give to God what is God's. You can. Your heart has not become perfected. You're still going to be tempted by sin. There will be spouts of rebellion. At times the Christian will stumble into sin. But the regenerated Christian, he truly does have the ability to obey God from the heart. You can. And if you don't have the desire to give to God what is God's, it could be a symptom. But you still have a dead heart. And you've not been born again because the evidence of the one who has been saved, the evidence of one who's been born again is a life that's been changed. Titus 2, 11, 12 says, The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce, that's to turn away from ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. The grace of God changes our motivations at the heart level, and then it affects even our behavior. It's noticeable. Well, look with me at the final verse one last time. I want you to see those words at the end of verse 17. They marveled at him. Friend, this is the life of the Christian. They marveled for the wrong reasons. We marvel at the wisdom of God's free grace and salvation. God found a way to get what he demands of us. Our heart We marvel because of the wisdom of God's free grace that Jesus in His wisdom, He found a way to get our hearts. God in His free grace found a way to get what rightfully belongs to Him and somehow our good, yours and mine, it's part of the deal. We can say, oh how He loves us. Oh how He loves us. The Christian life is one of marveling, marveling in gratitude for His mercies which are new every day. And in response, we continually repent. His mercies are new today. My repentance is new today. We habitually turn to Jesus day after day to give Him what is rightfully His. The Christian life is one of marveling that we get to. We get to be part of this wonderful plan. And in gratitude, we freely and willfully, oh, from my heart, this new heart, freely and willfully gives back to you. Polycarp didn't deny Christ because he said, I am a Christian. I belong to Jesus. I'm His possession. Polycarp didn't follow Jesus so as to get salvation. He had salvation. And so he followed Jesus. At the, Christ, at the cross, Christ bought stones. Remember the text, the context is temple. Christ bought stones for his new temple. And every one of us, every one of you who believes in Jesus from the heart, listen, you are a stone in that new temple. Let's real quickly consider some of the characteristics of one who, who is giving to God. What is God's? In other words, the characteristics of these temple stones in God's new temple. In short, the new spiritual temple, not made with hands, but made with the Spirit, it wants, as our mission statement says, to know God and to make Him known. Christ is precious to these new temple stones. Is Christ precious to you? Above all things, greatest mark of these stones is that Jesus is precious. Spiritual stones in God's spiritual temple, they want to give back to God financially from a heart of gratitude. Spiritual stones, they want to pray together. 
It's a house of prayer. You're one stone. I'm another. Yisakor's one. Amani's one. Hale's one. Abdallah's one. It is one. Each one of us who trusted it, we're one of these stones. We want to pray to our God, to be a place of knowing God. Prayer is this conversation with God in the temple of God. Prayer is faith become audible, as Tim Keller says. And spiritual stones want the fame. The fame of the king. Spiritual stones in God's spiritual temple. They want all the stones and all the other false temples to be torn down and brought to this construction project and built up. No longer stealing the glory of God. Listen, maybe you're not getting me. Last week, if you were here, we, we, did, we looked at a little kenny from Christ. And we ended by saying, you are the gold. You know how gold gets on your finger? You know how it gets on your necklace? You know how it gets on your tooth? It's put through a refining fire to make pure. Because the person who wants that gold loves it. Loves the way it shines. Christ has you in his refiner, fi refining fire. Your suffering, your discouragement, there's somebody here who's stuck in indwelling sin. You've been trying to put it to get to death for years, but God doesn't want you to be done with it yet because if you're done with it, you'd be prideful. You'd think you had accomplished it by your own strength and he lets you be stuck in that sin for a while. That someday when he delivers you, someday when that mountain is moved into the heart of the sea, you would say, Nobody could do this but God. Nobody could deliver me but God. Christ is purifying you to make you pure because he loves you. Not because he hates you, because he loves you. Trinity Fellowship, because God will have all of you or none of you, he bought you with a price. He is purifying you because God will have all of you or none of you. He gave up his life so that he would become your life. Give your life to Jesus. Give all of your heart to Jesus. He bought you with a price. Give back to God the things that are gone.